and welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and let's talk about Wilds of Eldraine and all of the cards that we will be playing in the Commander format. I picked out 30 cards here. There's a lot, all right? And, and you know, I did poo-poo on this set a little bit as it was getting spoiled. I didn't think there was so much that I could make a lot of spoiler videos. You know, it wasn't like, oh man, I got to make a video about this. There wasn't a lot of that going on. However, as I'm looking through all the cards, I'm like, oh, that's pretty good for Commander. Oh, that's pretty good too, right? I got at least five or six in here that I would say are absolute commander staples right out of the gate and then a whole bunch more that are for sure going to see some play in one way or another again kind of archetype specific i don't like to get super archetype specific with a lot of these cards like if something says draw a card whenever this tribe comes into play it's very obvious where that's going i don't think i need to talk about it i like to talk about stuff that's a little more interesting and maybe it's not obvious where it wants to get played talking about the 99 cards in this video i will not be talking about the commanders i'm going to do that in another video i don't even know exactly how I'm going to do it yet, but I will be doing it in another video. Let's just talk about some 99 cards. And I'm going to start out with a couple of cards that are absolute slam dunks for me in my decks. And this is what I like to see. I don't want to see like 50 commander staples. You know, I don't want to see 20 commanders that are going to be some of the most popular in the four. I don't want to see that. That's you know, right. So the complaining that I'm doing, because I've had some people go, oh, you're complaining so much. The complaining I'm doing is not that. We definitely don't need more commander staples and we definitely don't need more busted commanders. No question about it. I, I would be totally happy if they didn't do it at all. The way it used to happen back in the day is you just found the gems, the little cards that just happened to work good in commander, but weren't intended to, or the cards like this one that specifically just out of happenstance, you know, Wizards of the Coast is not making this card for my patron of the Katsune deck, but it is an absolute slam dunk there, coincidentally, right? Wear Fox Bodyguard, one white, white elf fox knight, two, two with flash. When Wear Fox Bodyguard enters the battlefield, exile up to one other target non-fox creature until Wear Fox Bodyguard leaves the battlefield. Pay one on a white sacrifice, Wear Fox Bodyguard, you gain two life. So I'll just say, I think this is a great commander card, period. I think it's a fantastic fit in a lot of decks. I like that it has flash, right? So there, there's two things that you can do with this card because it is so fantastic with what it's doing. I, I mean, there's lots of cards that do this. The Banisher Priest effect, this one is the best of I, I've ever seen for a number of reasons. First of all, I flash it in. I exile that Blightsteel Colossus that is attacking me and save my life. And it's going to stay exiled as long as I can keep my Werefox Bodyguard on the battlefield, right? The other thing that I can use this for is saving my own creature, right? So someone's casting a board wipe. I want to save my commander. I flash this guy in, exile my commander. My Werefox Bodyguard goes away and my commander now essentially survives the board wipe. Also though, because you can sacrifice it to its own ability, it allows you to bring that thing back whenever you want. So now if I want, maybe maybe someone's using targeted removal on my commander. I flash this guy in, save my commander from the removal. Of course, the removal fizzles. And now, whenever I feel like it, I can pay two mana, sacrifice this guy to gain two life, and my commander comes back. Just a phenomenal card for that kind. Of, I just love cards that are doing stuff like this. Again, creatures with ETB, creatures with flash. It's doing everything I love in a just card in general. On top of all that, again, as I mentioned, it's a slam dunk in my patron of the Katsune deck because not only is it a fox, so it fits the fox tribal thing. And I'll just point out, my commander is not a fox. Even though I'm doing the fox tribal, my, my commander is actually not a fox, so I can use this to save my commander because it says non-fox. And then on top of all that, it's actually gaining life as well. So it fits the life gain theme. I mean, it, it's almost like they printed this card specifically for my patron of the Katsune deck. And I love that. I mean, they didn't. And I guarantee you they didn't. But I, I love these kinds of finds. Also, absolute slam dunk in a deck of mine is Hilda's Crown of Winter. And this one a little less so because obviously there's a tapping theme here with a couple of the commanders. So it's obvious that they did it for that reason. I love that they made it a colorless card though, right? I really like when they make colorless cards that do these very specific things. In the commander format, obviously, things are color specific. So it's nice that it's colorless so it can fit in. Anyone who happens to be doing this theme, no matter what color you're playing, you now have a nice option, right? Three mana, legendary artifact, pay one and tap, tap target creature. This ability costs one less to activate during your turn. So if you do this on your turn, it's going to be free. Just tap it. Pretty great. But even if you want to do it on your opponent's turn, it's only going to cost one. That's not bad. Pay three, sacrifice Hilda's Crown of Winter. Draw a card for each tap creature your opponent's control. So obviously we know where this is going in the, the themes that are in this set. 
But as I mentioned already in a video, I have an Abishon deck that is doing exactly this. I have Verity Circle in there that's drawing me cards for tapping my creatures. I have Boring 100,000 Arrows, right? Again, cards that were sort of fringe and janky where now I just have another option. And, you know, funny enough, it's actually already becoming difficult to find room in that deck, but I gotta find room for this, right? Same with my Patriot of the Katsune deck. I gotta find room for that Werefox Bodyguard. I gotta find room for this in my Abishon deck because it's an absolute slam dunk. And again, probably goes in a lot of other decks as well, right? I'm not just mentioning these cards because they're fantastic for me. They're probably fantastic in a lot of decks. Another one that is likely going to be going in a deck of mine is Virtue of Courage. And again, this is probably one, I imagine this getting a lot of buzz. There is a cycle of these Virtue cards and obviously it's an adventure and adventure is a huge theme in this set. I think they went a little overboard. Again, just really went nuts with the whole adventure thing. I will point out adventures you cast from exile. So anyone that is doing exile tribal like Prosper or Faldor and any of those commanders, of course, there's a ton. These cards are extra good because you cast the adventure side, then it goes on adventure, then you cast it from exile. So just pointing that out. Also, this is extra good there for another reason. So the adventure side, one in a red instant, Embrith Blaze deals two damage to any target. So it's a really bad shock. That's fine. You know, you don't even have to use it. You can if you want to. Having the option is nice. You're likely going to be putting this in your deck for the enchantment side, though. Three red, red. Whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent. So again, we're doing the non-combat damage thing. So any of those decks, and there's lots of cards we've seen that do this, this is just another option. You may exile that many cards from the top of your library. You may play those cards this turn. So the deck I'm considering this for, I'll give the perfect example here, my Bralin deck. I think this is a pretty fantastic fit. And obviously because my Bralin is doing lots of non-combat damage by dealing damage to all my opponents, right? So I discard a card, put a counter on my commander. I deal one damage to each of my opponents, exile those cards, and I get to play them this turn. And again, the wording here is play, right? There's a couple phrases here, wordings here that I think are really important. This is source you control. It doesn't have to be a creature, first of all. So that's important. This is exile that many, which of course is a very important wording. And it's also play from exile. So that means you're getting a land, right? And this is... This this card in most decks, like again, my Bralin deck or any deck where you're repeatedly doing damage to all your opponents, this is guaranteed get a land drop every turn, right? Because you just play your, like you're never going to want to play a land from your hand. You're going to want to play that land from exile because you're almost guaranteed, always guaranteed to get one. I don't love Impulse Draw. I'll just say I'm not a huge fan of it. Again, I exile my Blasphemous Act. I don't want to cast it right away. I've just exiled the best board wipe in my deck, assuming I'm playing a mono red deck, which in this case I am. It's just gone. I never get to cast it again, right? So I don't love that. However, this is really good card advantage for a deck like my Bralin deck where you're doing that repeatedly, right? Maybe that River Song, you know, I was ma making a deck for my uh, patron who wanted me to make them a River Song deck. And I, I literally saw this card around the same time and I'm like, seems pretty good there. Cause again, there's a commander where you're repeatedly doing non-combat damage to your opponents, just free value, right? And funny enough, this is exile cards from the top of your library. So um, with, with that commander, you play from the bottom of your library. So you'll be playing from both sides of your library there. A pretty neat fit there. Anyway, it's certainly a card that's going to see a ton of play. I'm going to talk about one more of these virtues. And I think all of these virtues are going to see play in the format. This to me is the second best one. I think the red one's probably the one that's going to see the most play simply because it's red. I really like the white one as well. Again, I might put this in a deck of mine, my Lulu deck, because it is literally doing the exact same as a Lulu. So the adventure side, again, Arden Vale, Fealty, one in a white instant adventure, created to two white knight creature token with vigilance, always usable in a commander game. Again, just like the shock ability, you can use it. You don't have to though. You just cast the enchantment side, three white, white enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, put a plus one counter on each Creature you control, untap those creatures. How many decks does that fit in? It fits in all the plus one, plus one counter themes, right? This is, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. It's, it's not like Lulu where they have to be tapped. You just put them on all your creatures. You don't have to actually do anything. You just, creatures just sit there and on your end step, you got a counter on all of them. They're also getting untapped though. So any aggro strategy is going to love this, right? Again, the plus one, plus one counter decks are going to love it. The aggro strategies are going to love it because I can just go nuts, attack with all my creatures and then untap them all. And they're also getting the buff, right? It's one of those cards that it certainly fits the theme of certain decks, but also it can go in any deck. I guess, unless you don't have creatures, any creature heavy deck is going to love that card for sure. 
Let's take a look at Teg Will's scouring. And this is one that uh, you know, I'm a little on the fence about. I'm not sure about this one, but let's take a look. For Black Black Sorcery, you may cast Teg Will's scouring as though it had flash by tapping three untapped creatures you control with flying in addition to paying its other costs. So that's not bad. It's okay. You know, as I've stated recently in a video, I actually don't think the black board wipes in the commander format are super fantastic. There's a couple of really good ones. Trails off pretty quickly though. And this could be a good option. Six mana is a lot for a board wipe, but this is definitely doable. Destroy all creatures. Create three one one black fairy creature tokens with flying. So as I say all the time, I like the board wipes that are advantage me. And this is advantaging you in two ways. Advantage number one, obviously, is I blow up all the creatures and then I get three tokens. So that's my advantage. I'm getting creatures and no one else has them. The other advantage is I can cast it at instant speed. And this is why you don't see instant speed board wipes very often because it's a massive advantage for you, right? It's one of the reasons Cyclonic Rift is so good. If I have those three flying creatures, and again, fairy, tribal, or, you know, there's a lot of tribes, demons, right? This might be a good demon tribal board wipe. I can do it at instant speed, so I can do it on my opponent's end step. All the creatures are destroyed. I get those three fairies, untap on my turn, and then start going to town. So that makes the six mana a lot less bad, right? I don't really want to cast a six mana board wipe on my turn unless I'm getting a huge advantage off of it, like Austere Command or something. But if I can cast this six mana board wipe on my opponent's turn, and then I untap on my turn and I can start casting creatures right away, that's where it becomes really, really good. So I think for sure that this to me seems like a card that is, if you're in that tribal, like maybe even dragon tribal, right? If you're in black and you got a lot of, of flying, right? Any tribal flying theme, this definitely would, would give consideration for as a board wipe because again, the instant speed is can be a huge upside for you. Again, getting to the thematic stuff and we got a ton of fairy tribal. That was the other thing. There's a few things that they really focused on here. The aura enchantment they focused on. So if you're doing any enchantment tribal or aura, not that that needed any more help for sure in the commander format. Um, the adventure thing, right? F certainly we got a ton of that. And the fairy tribal, again, not that fairy tribal needed a ton of support, but we got a ton of that. And I'm not going to talk about the super specific fairy tribal stuff. I'm going to talk about the stuff that here's just a good creature. I think if you're not doing fairy tribal, so fairy blade crafter, two and a black fairy rogue, two, two. And I will point out this is a rogue. So could fit in some rogue tribal decks as well. Right? So keep that in mind. A lot of black rogue tribal decks out there has flying. Whenever one or more fairies you control deal combat damage to a player, put a plus one counter on fairy blade crafter. And again, people will look at this and go, okay, well, fairy tribal, right? This guy's a fairy. So whenever this guy deals combat damage to a player, you're going to put a plus one, plus one counter on them. That's pretty good. And when it dies, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life where X is its power. Seems pretty good. And again, if I'm in a rogue tribal deck as well, that's where I really would focus on this outside of fairy tribal. Seems like a pretty good fit. Every time he connects, you're putting a counter on him. And when he dies, you get the life gain, life drain. Another one, again, outside of fairy tribal that I think could fit is Talion's Messenger. Two and a blue, fairy noble, one three with flying. So I guess this one's not a rogue. I still think it's just a really good creature in a lot of decks. Whenever you attack with one or more fairies, draw a card, then discard a card. When you discard a card this way, put a plus one counter on target fairy you control. So again, this is your only fairy. So whenever you attack with this creature, and this is not even a deal damage, this is only a attack trigger. So whenever you attack with a fairy, this is a fairy, you get to loot, which is always good. And you also put a plus one, plus one counter on target fairy. You put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. So this creature just attacks every turn, loots, and puts a counter on itself, right? A lot of people really like Ledger Shredder. Pretty comparable. I'd say maybe even better because Ledger Shredder is, you don't really have a lot of control over whether you're doing that or not. Here, you're always getting the counter and you're always looting on every single one of your turns unless every single one of your opponents has a flying blocker. So uh, again, it's putting counters on itself. Blue, green, plus one, plus one counter theme might be a great fit. I want to draw my second card each turn. I want to loot. I want to discard. A lot of themes where this guy can fit outside of fairy tribal. The last one, again, another fairy that is doing the fairy tribal thing. Not really. Actually, this one's not really doing fairy tribal at all, but obviously it's in the pre-con. Blightwing Bandit, three and a black fairy rogue, two, two, flying and death touch. So great combination of abilities there. Whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, look at the top card of that player's library, then exile it face down. You may play that card for as long as it remains exiled and mana value of any type can be spent to cast it. They've started rearranging the wording there. It used to never be worded like that. So I have a two, two flying death touch block 
blocker, which is great. And whenever I cast a spell during my opponent's turn, obviously it fits in the fairy tribal because you, a lot of flash going on with the fairy tribal, but fits in a lot of other decks as well. It's just great value. And if you're doing the play from exile, if you're doing the, I want to play my opponent's stuff, lots of decks doing that. I will also point out, it has that very important wording again. You may play that card for as long as it remains exiled. So your Blightwing Bandit is long gone. You've exiled three cards with it. Again, just like with Praetor's Grass, same thing. It can sit there for the entire game and you just cast it at your leisure, right? So I think this is just a great value card in general. That can fit, again, it's a rogue, fits in those rogue tribal decks as well. The fairy tribal is obvious. Outside of fairy tribal, I think that fits in a lot of decks for sure. All right, let's talk about Knight of Sweets Revenge. And again, the food theme is massive. And, you know, again, very archetype specific. I think they went overboard with the food theme. I'll just say, especially since we got a ton in Lord of the Rings already. And I was talking about this in the in the last spoiler video I did, and I had a guy say he likes when they do, you know, when they throw out these support cards for these janky themes and for these niche themes. This ain't niche, guys. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Food might have been niche, might have been niche earlier this year. After getting Lord of the Rings and this set, it's not niche anymore. Not by a long shot, okay? I, I looked up, again, I talked about my archetypes last week and... Talking about the archetypes and which are the most popular ones, I looked up a couple. Mutate was an interesting one that I looked up. And there are about 10,000 decks on EDH Rec that are doing the Mutate theme, okay? And Mutate came out in only one set. There is only 39 cards in existence that are dealing with Mutate, and there still is 10,000 decks, okay? And obviously only a few commanders that are doing it. We have way more for food, okay? It is not a niche thing, not by a long shot. There are now over 100 cards in the commander format dealing with food, over 100. And that is outside of all the, you know, parallel lives, whenever you create a token, all that kind of stuff, which also supports that theme. And more so what I don't love about it, right? I'm trying not to do too much complaining in this video. This is the only time I'm gonna complain, I promise, is that all the food support stuff seems to be completely ignoring what food are actually doing. Food on their own are not great. Pay two mana and tap, sacrifice to gain three life. I, I think when they made them, they thought that was pretty good. And nobody, like who out there, raise your hand if you've actually ever just, I pay two mana and sacrifice to gain three life in a commander game. Who's actually done that? I've done it a couple times. It's rare though, that you will actually pay two mana to gain three life because in a commander game, that's not very good, right? So what they do, what they did with the Lord of the Rings set a ton, and with this said as well is let's find other ways to make food good, which I don't love, right? Food aren't good on their own. So let's figure out other ways to make them usable because you're just going to have a bunch lying around that you don't want to sacrifice to gain life. So let's figure out another way to make them good. And of course, this card is doing exactly that. Three green enchantment. When Night of Sweets Revenge enters the battlefield, create a food token. So it's only giving you one, but of course, again, there's so much other food support out there, it doesn't really matter. Foods you control have tap at a green. So we're turning all of our foods into mana rocks. Already that's phenomenal. Creating food tokens, of course, again, not that difficult. So this is already getting really good. And, and again, what I don't love about it is now we're food or creating green mana. Like what? What's going on here? This doesn't make a lot of sense. They're just trying to figure out a way to make food more viable. Also, again, not only do we have that, but now we're going to put a win con on this card as well. Pay five green green, which is a lot, but... Remember, we're tapping all our foods for mana. Sacrifice, Knight of Sweets, Revenge. Creatures you control get plus X, plus X until end of turn where X is the number of foods you control activated only as a sorcery. Of course, that's not even a downside because you're only going to want to do this on your turn anyway. So now I have seven food in play, which again is not difficult, right? Even, uh, again, this is what I'm talking about. Even in my janky mono green, I'm making food. I now have a card that I have these seven food in, in play, which aren't that difficult to create. I tap them all for mana. So I don't even have to use my lands. I tap all my seven food to pay for this ability. And my entire team gets plus seven, plus seven until end of turn. I don't want to say this is a crater hoof behemoth for a food deck, but it certainly is an alternative. It is definitely a win con for a food deck, right? So I don't think this is a bad card. I don't necessarily want to complain about that. I just don't like that now we've taken, 
you know, like I said, we, we've taken a theme that just earlier in this year was sort of a janky, fun, you know, sort of out there theme that you sort of had to figure out ways to make it good where you don't have to figure out ways to make it good anymore. It, just stapled on this card alone is a whole bunch of it, right? So, you know, it's very easy. Now, if I can just create a bunch of food, that Hobbit from the, from the last, <laughs> from Lord of the Rings, again, there's another very easy win con for your food deck, right? That they're not even making it difficult anymore. That's the part that I don't particularly love about it. It certainly is not a niche archetype in the commander format, not by a long shot. All right, moving on. Let's talk about misleading signpost. And I, I thought I would give this one a mention. It's interesting. Two and a blue artifact with flash and taps to add a blue. So it is a mana rock, a three mana mana rock that only adds blue. It's got flash. So, you know, there's zero chance someone's going to put that in their deck unless there's a pretty good reason to. There's a decent reason to. I honestly, I don't know how much play this is going to see in the format. When Misleading Signpost enters the battlefield during the Declare Attacker step, so obviously that's when you're going to play it, you may reselect which player or permanent target attacking creature is attacking. So someone attacks you, right? You, you do this during the Declare Attacker step, which means, you know, getting into the whole rules of the, of the game here, your opponent declares their attackers, their Blightsteel Colossus, that's coming at you. Then it's still the Declare Attacker step. You get a, a opportunity to respond spawn before we go to the next step you flash this in and look at that now it's attacking someone else that seems pretty good it's not bad it's already already a mana rock too however if you're getting really excited about this card and you think it's super unique and super interesting they already had a card that did exactly this that they printed in a commander set a long time ago portal mage that absolutely nobody <laughs> plays i don't know how many people play this card i never see it two and a blue human wizard two two with flash when portal mage enters the battlefield during the declare attacker step you may reselect which player or permanent target attack so it's doing the exact same thing three mana flash the only difference is a two two body instead of a mana rock so you know j just pointing out if anyone is getting excited about misleading signpost, Portal Mage is doing the exact same thing except a, a creature. Maybe because it's a mana rock that makes it better. I don't know. You could get into the situation where I save my life with it. Sure, it, it might be worth it. How much play is it going to see? I don't know. Really interesting card that I that I for sure was kind of excited about when I first saw it. Ox Drover 3 and a white human peasant 4-4 four, four with vigilance. Ox Drover can't be blocked by oxen. Whenever Ox Drover enters the battlefield or attacks, target opponent creates a 2-4 white ox creature token and you draw a card. So... I will point out, like I'm talking about this card for a couple of reasons. It is not a great <laughs> white card draw option, in my opinion. Okay, again, we are once again making, and there's other cards in this set that is white card draw because apparently Wizards of the Coast might still think that white needs card draw. I can't possibly think of a reason why. If I'm putting white card draw in my deck, this card is so far down the list. No chance am I putting this in my deck to draw cards, okay? It's a nice little advantage, all right? Four mana creature enters the battlefield, I get to draw a card, but I have to donate a creature. And then when I attack, I get to draw, like that. There is so many better options in white now than this for drawing cards, okay? I'm not talking about it for that reason. In fact, I'm partially talking about it to, again, hammer home the point that white does not need any more card draw. Not by a long shot. However, where I like this card is it's the donate a creature to my opponents, right? And it's not donate, I shouldn't say that. When you create a creature under an opponent's control, it's not your creature, it's their creature. That is their creature, they own it and they control it, just so that's clear. However, this is a important card in the commander format because it is a card that is giving my opponents creatures, which a lot of decks want. There's a lot of decks out there that actually want your opponents to have creatures for various reasons, okay? And you could do this in the huggy theme. Certainly this will fit in those hug decks. No question about it. I think it is more likely though that this is going to fit in those decks where I want my opponents to have creatures because it advantages me. Mathis Fiend Seeker, probably the best example here, where I need my opponents to have creatures in play in order for my commander's ability to do anything. Might be a great fit there, right? That's why I like this card in the commander format. I put it in my Mathis deck. I donate a 2-4 Ox to my opponent because then I can put the bounty counter on it because I need my opponent to have creatures, right? So I like it in the commander format for that reason. It's a pretty neat card. All right, let's talk about Twining Twins. 
Another adventure card uh, that I thought was worth talking about. Swift Spiral is the adventure side. One and a white instant adventure. Exile target non-token creature. Return to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So that side, again, specific wording here. You can't exile token creatures, which the reason why is because you can just exile your opponent's token creature and of course it won't come back. That's why as a blink spell, people might pass this over, but you can exile your opponent's creatures temporarily. It, it, this can really be again blightsteel colossus situation but a lot of other situations as well my opponent is playing an avison deck right and then they cast that armageddon to blow up everyone's lands i respond with this blink their avison and it doesn't come back till the end step so they lose their lands as well right and there's a thousand scenarios where that can be good you can use it on yourself as well and of course there's a white blue card so it seems pretty good in all those white blue blinking decks for which there are a ton but just i think you know even if you're just in a white blue controlly theme this might be a good card for that reason right maybe you have a creature you want to blink but maybe you want to get your opponent's creature off the board the creature side two blue blue fairy wizard four four flying vigilance ward one just a really good creature that i can just cast later in the game good blocker good attacker because it's got vigilance and flying fairy tribal wizard tribal right any of those is going to fit good as well. Just a pretty neat card. Again, where are you going to find room for it? Maybe in a blinking deck, but you could also find rooms for it outside of those as well, I think. Let's talk about Agatha's Soul Cauldron. Definitely an interesting card. Two mana, legendary artifact. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate abilities of creatures you control. Creatures you control with plus one, plus one counters on them have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with Agatha's Soul Cauldron. And of course, you're going to tap it and exile target card from a graveyard. When a creature card is exiled, this way put a plus one counter on target creature you control so there's a whole lot going on here i'm tr gonna try to be quick about it first of all this is graveyard hate hey always want graveyard hate in your commander deck repeatable graveyard hate it only hits one card at a time but it is still graveyard hate so if i have a relic of progenitus in my deck already possibly i could just swap this out right if what else it is doing is fitting my deck and of course what else is doing i think you could put this in any deck yes certainly because you can exile a card from a graveyard put a counter on your commander or whatever other creature and then now activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with it so i have to find a creature in a graveyard with an activated ability i mean it could be a sakura tribe elder and now i can sacrifice my my token creature to go get a land right again i'm just throwing out scenarios here that maybe people haven't thought of exile a mana dork from my opponent's graveyard this might be really good in a mill deck where you're filling your opponent's graveyard that's a scenario where people might not think to put this in i mill my opponent who's playing green and i can now get their Sakura tribe elder their mana dork turn one of my creatures into a mana dork a theme where i'm just killing my opponent's creatures all the time again like that mathis deck now i can pick the creature with the activated ability send it to the graveyard exile it and now i get it obviously if you're doing a plus one plus one counter theme because this is creatures you control with plus one plus one counters on them so i don't even have to do the exiling thing a whole lot now i all my creatures have plus one, plus one counters on them. And all I have to do is exile again, maybe a mana dork from my opponent's graveyard or my graveyard, right? I can do this on my graveyard too. So you can even do some setup here if you want to, right? I can discard a creature, a card with a really great activated ability, a Razaketh. I don't know. Discard that Razaketh into my graveyard, right? If you really want to build around this card. And now all my creatures have that ability, right? Because they all have plus one, plus one counters on them. So there's just a lot of neat things you can do with this card. You could... Put this card in any deck and it will do work for you, for sure. But particularly, I think it's good in certain themes where I'm filling my opponent's graveyard and or I am putting counters on my own creatures. For sure, it, it's going to be a great fit there. Really neat commander card. All right, Gruff Triplets, three green, green, Seder, Warrior 3-3 three, three with Trample, Gruff Triplets enters the battlefield. If it isn't a token, create two tokens that are copies of it. When Gruff Triplet dies, put a number of plus one plus one counters equal to its power on each creature you control, name Gruff Triplet. So a card that you could probably put in a lot of different decks, uh, a sacrifice theme maybe, because I can play this guy, sacrifice the two tokens, then this guy's going to be enormous like right away but again where it's particularly good is in the either plus one plus one counter theme where i can like double the amount of counters on creatures stuff like that right i'm not going to do the math on the potential here right i have a doubling season in play what, what's the math there someone can figure it out for me i have a doubling season in play i play my gruff triplets it's obviously going to create more tokens i'm going to get double the tokens and then as i sacrifice them it gets more counters as well once i get down to the the, the final copy 
how big is that creature? Somebody do the math. Let me know in the comments below. But again, those situations, right? I'm playing an Adrix and Nev deck. Seems like a pretty good fit in any Adrix and Nev deck, right? So the counter and or token theme, it's extra good, but probably could go in almost any commander deck if you're just looking for maybe a big beater. Let's talk about Likeness Looter. Again, another card that pretty good in certain themes, but could fit in just about any deck. Blue and a black, Fairy Shapeshifter 1-1 one, one with flying. Has a looting ability, right? Tap, draw a card, then discard a card. And has X, Likeness Looter becomes a copy of target creature card in your graveyard with mana value X, except it has flying and has this ability. Activate only as a sorcery. So now I can loot something into the graveyard and then immediately turn this into it. We'll just point out, I mean, first of all, if you have you have that Lazav deck, this is very similar to Lazav. It could be like a backup for your Lazav, for sure. I think it's a slam dunk there. I will point out though, I had some patrons getting really excited about this card and I'm sure there's a lot of other people as well. Demir Doppelganger, a card that I really like, has been in the format since forever. I think it's originally from like Ravnica. That is, you know, you could argue that Likeness Looter is better, but Demir Doppelganger, first of all, it's not as a sorcery. Second of all, this is creature card in your graveyard and Demir Doppelganger can steal creatures from your opponent's graveyard. Demir Doppelganger exiles, which might be bad for you, but is good because it can exile creatures from your opponent's graveyard. So it's also graveyard hate and it's only three mana. Whereas again, if I want to exile a Razaketh with this guy, it's going to cost me eight mana. My uh, Demir Doppelganger turns into a Razaketh for only three mana. Just saying. So again, if you're super excited, just like with the Portal Mage, if you're super excited about Likeness Looter and you are well within your rights to be, give Demir Doppelganger a look as well. All right, let's move on to the land cycle that we got here, the two color land cycle. And to me, like when I saw these, I'm like, I think these are better than the original two color enemy pairing lands that we had from before. They're easy slots. I'm not going to talk about all of them. They're easy slots into a lot of decks, whether you're doing the theme or not. So let's talk about Restless Bivouac. They enter the battlefield tapped. This is the red white version. So in a Boros deck, it's going to tap for the mana you need. Pay one red and a white. Restless Bivouac becomes a 2-2 two -two red and white. Ox, creature token until end of turn. However, whenever you attack with it, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control on any creature. That seems pretty good. If you want to be putting counters on your commander or anything else, it's a land, right? So it's a really easy slot into a lot of red and white decks. I'll talk about Restless Cottage as well. Again, I'm not going to talk about them all. This one's also really, really good. It's the black green version. So again, enters the battlefield tapped, taps for black and a green, pay two black and a green. Restless Cottage becomes a four, four black and green horror creature token until end of turn. It's still a land. Whenever it attacks again they're, they're all attack triggers which is great because you're guaranteed to get it create a food token so again with the food i mean again just nice value uh, if you're in a black green deck that just wants to be sacrificing stuff it could just be good for sacrificing but also exile up to one target card from a graveyard so graveyard hate on your land i love it easily slot this into any black green deck and i might i have a black green deck i don't know if i could fit this in here but i might let's talk about discerning financier and again this is the white has to have ramp and card draw right and or so this fits into both categories you know in every single set and i think this is definitely going to see play Play. It's on the fence for me. It could be good in certain situations. So two and a white human noble two three at the beginning of your upkeep. If an opponent controls more lands than you, create a treasure token. So this is one of those cards that if it came out three, four years ago, everyone would be playing it because it's doing the thing that white supposedly needs. And also if an opponent controls more lands than you was way more the case back in the day for mono white and Boros decks. However, I don't know if that's the case anymore, right? I just talked about Deep Gnome Terrams at Mancer in a video that I think is one of the best ramp cards in the entire format. And it gets you above the lands, right? That doesn't even have that stipulation. You can get more lands than your opponent with that guy. That's why he's extra good. Does white need this? Does a mono white deck need this? I don't think so. And yes, there's another ability, which I haven't gotten to. I'm only going to be playing this, I think, in a deck where, you know, again, I have a Benny Brax deck where I want to be creating tokens where this could fit. Maybe, I mean, there's a chance you don't get a treasure token off this if no one has more lands than you, right? That's the downside. And then the last ability, pay two and a white, choose another player. That player gains control of target treasure you control. You may draw a card, which if you're not creating the treasures, that obviously does nothing. One of the things I've said about Smothering Tithe, I'm going to try not to go off on a tangent here, is yeah, that card's great, but... I have played more games than I can count where dude's got a smother. I just played one the other day with my patrons where dude's got a smothering tithe in play, zillion treasures, but his hand's empty. 
So what, like, it, he doesn't even care. He's got, he literally had like 30 treasures, but they were useless because he had no card. He wasn't drawing anything. This is a great card for that, where now I'll just start donating those treasures like crazy and drawing cards. Right? I got to turn those useless treasures. I know it seems crazy to say, but treasures can be useless sometimes. They're not always super busted. Now I can turn those useless treasures into card draw, which in my opinion is way more important than creating treasures. So I don't know. It's a toughie. This is one of those cards that, you might want to try it out and you might find you're in a situation, like if you're already creating lots of treasures, could be good because that second ability is always going to be good. The first ability, you might get nothing off of it, right? So that's where it, it can be a little iffy. Hard to say. We'll see how popular this one is in the format. All right, Beseech the Mirror, one black, 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 bargain. Search your library for a card, exile it face down, then shuffle. If the spell was bargained, you may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. If that spell's mana value was four or less, put the exiled card in your hand if it wasn't cast this way. So if it wasn't cast this way, this is just a four mana tutor, which of course is not great. In fact, is even worse than a diabolic tutor if you're just doing that. Now that's not horrible. You know, if you don't want to bargain, and I guess I should talk about the bargain mechanic here. Obviously it's new in this set, but outside of the bargain, right? Let's just cover that scenario. This is search your library for a card, exile it, put that card into your hand if it wasn't cast. So this just becomes a four mana tutor. That's it. Of course, that's always going to be good. It's not bad. Now the bargain ability says you may sacrifice an artifact enchantment or token as you cast this spell. Then this becomes go search your library for a mana value four or less card and cast it for free. Pretty good. So any deck in black, I would say, I mean, you could cast like a toxic deluge, right? You can cast board wipes and stuff with this. That's why I like it. You can also, if you're in any deck in black where I have that one card that just happens to be four mana value or less that I was really important to me. Now I can just go get it and cast it, you know, say it's an enchantment, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Some creature that I really, really badly want. I'm getting it right away. This is four mana, essentially put it directly into play. Like if I'm in a black deck where I'm okay with the sacrifice or I have a thing that I really, really want out of my deck that's four mana value or less, I think I would probably find room for this. It, it's pretty good there. All right, let's talk about one other bargain card. And again, I don't love the bargain mechanic. It's okay. I think in certain themes, it could be good. Is this card gonna see play? Curious, I'm not sure. Thunderous debut, six green, green. So that big splashy green spell, eight mana, that's a lot. And there's no discount here. Has the bargain ability. Look at the top 20 cards of your library. That's a lot. You may reveal up to two creature cards from among them. If this spell was bargained, put the revealed cards onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put the revealed cards into your hand, then shuffle. So this one, I'm talking about it because I think it'll probably see play in the commander format. I'm also talking about it because this is one where there's no chance you're not going to bargain. There, There is no chance I'm going to pay eight mana just to look at the top 20 cards and put two creatures into my hand. No chance. I'm going to sacrifice an, my mana rock or any token I have lying around or even an enchantment if I have to because those creatures are going directly into play. And that seems pretty good. Still think Tooth and Nail is better than this, right? Tooth and nail, I go get any two creatures and put them directly into play. It's a little more expensive, but not much. It's still pretty good. I look at the top 20 cards. That's a lot. Get a couple of creatures, put them directly into play. I don't know. How much buzz is this getting? Are people going to play it? I think it's all right. Certainly good in a few decks. Let's talk about Extraordinary Journey. XX blue, blue enchantment. When Extraordinary Journey enters the battlefield, exile up to X target creatures. For each of those creatures, its owner may play it for as long as it remains exiled. So that part I like because, of course, I can hit my opponent's creatures and I can hit mine if I want to blink them or whatever. It's kind of expensive, right? So two creatures, if I just want to hit one of mine, one of my opponents, I am paying six mana. That's a lot. Why I think this card's really good, though, is for the second ability. Whenever one or more non-token creatures enter the battlefield, if one or more of them entered from exile or was cast from exile, you draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. That's why you're playing this card. It is obviously going to fit in a ton of decks, and you are going to likely just pay the blue blue and screw the X. We're not even going to use that first ability. I'm just in a blinking deck or I'm in a cast that stuff from exile, right? Anything where you're casting from exile repeatedly works on your opponents too, of course. Non-token creatures entering the battlefield from exile or cast from exile. So if your opponents have a suspend deck, you're getting triggers off of this. It's only once each turn, still totally worth it. I can get a trigger on my opponent's turn because they're doing suspend or they're doing exile tribal playing that prosper deck. I'm also getting the trigger on my turn because I'm doing blinking, whatever. Certainly going to see play in the format. And again, I like that it fits in those particular themes, right? All right, let's talk about a card that, yeah, this, this might be a bit of a hidden gem here. I don't know if anyone's talking about this. I think it's pretty good. The Princess Takes Flight, two in a white saga. 
Chapter 1, exile up to one target creature. That's it, just exile a creature for three mana, that seems pretty good. Chapter 2, target creature you control gets plus 2, plus 2, and gains flying until end of turn. Pretty good, we can use that in any deck. First ability we can use in any deck, second ability we can use in any deck. Chapter 3, return the exiled card to the battlefield under its owner's control. And that's the part that I think gets really unique and interesting for a couple of reasons. Obviously, I can exile... Again, my creature or my opponent's creature. I like the versatility there. So I can exile my commander, then I cast a board wipe, then two turns later I get my commander back. I can exile my opponents, again, Blightsteel Colossus, get it off the board for a while. Or I can exile my opponent's Blightsteel Colossus, sacrifice my own Saga, and that chapter three will not trigger. You know, you can get into the situation where they're not getting that creature back. If I blink this and reset it, if I, you know, I just keep it from getting to chapter three, remove the counters, exile, whatever. That's where this card gets interesting. I like the delay there. I can get a creature off the table temporarily, whether it be mine or my opponent's, but also I can just exile a creature and then keep it from ever getting to chapter three and that creature's just gone forever. So pretty neat card there, I think. Fairy Slumber Party. And this is a card that when I first read it, I'm like, that card is bonkers. And then I read it again. I'm like, okay, it doesn't work exactly like I thought. I, I read it incorrectly. So for blue, blue sorcery, return all creatures to owner's hands. For each opponent who controlled a creature, return this way. You create two one, one blue fairy creature tokens with flying. And this creature can block only creatures with flying. And of course, I think a lot of people probably when they first read this card, they're like, that's insane. Because, you know, I guess maybe you think each creature that was bounced. So I bounced 10 of my opponent's creatures and I get 20 fairies. That's insane. No, it's for each opponent. So if I'm in a typical four player commander game, I have three opponents. I bounce creatures from those three opponents. That means I'm getting two fairies for each opponent, which means I'm getting six. So six mana, I bounce all creatures, including mine, obviously. I get six fairies. That's not bad. I actually think that's pretty good. Might be a good fit in some decks. However, I think this card will be overshadowed by another blue card that is sort of pseudo board wiper, definitely deals with your opponent's creatures, Asinine Antics, which I already talked about, which is, I think, one of the best cards from this set and is going to see an absolute ton of play without question. The last few cards I'm talking about here are going to be the ones that are absolute slam dunks in the commander format. And I think, you know, they're, they're what I think are the best cards from this set for the commander format. And this one is absolutely for sure going to see a ton of play for various reasons. Two blue, blue sorcery. You may cast it as though it had flash by paying two more. That's good. Certainly there is a situation where you might want to do that. For each creature, your opponent's control, create a cursed roll token attached to that creature. So this card is amazing for a bunch of reasons. I'll, I'll throw a few out there, again, just to give you guys ideas how it could be extra good. If you have a Tabor and Lumia deck, for anyone out there, and funny enough, I just made one a little while ago, where... I'm dealing one damage to all my opponent's creatures. I mean, every creature, but this is just four mana. I turn all my opponent's creatures into one ones and then I kill them all with my commander. If you are in that Silumgar Drifting Death deck, which I used to have, where I can give my opponent's creatures minus one, minus one. Also a slam dunk for the same reason of now they're all just dead. If you're in any deck where you're just throwing damage around, you know, one damage to each creature, that kind of thing, or minus one, minus one, slam dunk for sure, okay? If I'm in an enchantment tribal deck of various different themes, slam dunk. Again, I gave the Eidolon of Blossoms example where I am just creating a whole bunch of enchantments that is gonna draw me a ton of cards. Or I have a sphere of safety where now I control a zillion enchantments and no one can attack me. Those scenarios, extra, extra good, of course. However, I am considering this, I have two mono blue decks. I'm considering this for both of them. Uh, it's just a great way to deal with your opponent's creatures. If my opponent has a Bane of Progress, I just made their Bane of Progress huge. Okay, but a lot of situations, like I'm against a mono red deck, how are you gonna get this off your commander, right? You're gonna have a heck of a time doing it. So it fits really, really nicely in a lot of those situations, but also is just a pretty great way, I'd say in a mono blue deck for dealing with your opponent's creatures. Pretty darn good. Definitely gonna see a lot of play in the commander format. Another card that is gonna see a ton of play in the commander format, or maybe not, because again, this is another situation and I've talked about the white card draw, I've talked about the white ramp, both of which I think don't need help at all, okay? White removal certainly doesn't need help, but I mean, you gotta print some white cards, so what are they gonna be doing? You're gonna have the great white removal. And of course we got a phenomenal, in my opinion, commander staple white targeted removal spell. And we also got a phenomenal white staple board wipe for the format, which I will be talking about next. It's getting silly at this point. I said 
two years ago, that white was by far the best color at removal. And now it's just getting silly. I just talked about this in a deck doctor video for one of my patrons where it's like, you know, you're going to put generous gift in your deck. Probably that's my first choice. Only mono white. First choice, generous gift, excise the imperfect we just got in March of the Machine Aftermath, which is doing something very similar, non-land, but it's exiles. And now we have this option as well. These are probably going to be my first three options, even if I'm just playing a mono-white deck. Stroke of Midnight, destroy target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a 1-1 white human creature token. So this is better than generous gift because it only gives your opponent a 1-1. It's worse though because it doesn't hit lands. It's three mana, it's instant speed. All those three cards are all three mana. So it's like, okay, you could make a mono white deck and just put those three in. Yeah, they're all in the three mana slot, but I think that's fine. I don't think that's enough removal. I like removal in my deck, but you would be okay. If you were making a mono white deck, I put in two board wipes. This is the bare minimum. I put in two board wipes and I put in those three instant speed, three mana value, hit any permanent removal spells in my deck, you'll be okay. It's not enough for me, but that's the bare minimum. Fateful Absence, right? This is what I talked about in that patron video I did. That's a card that when it came out in Midnight Hunt, it was my favorite card from that set. I had it at number one. I'm taking it out of my decks right now, right? I took Return to Dust out of my decks. Again, I just talked about that in a video as well. There's a card that I've been playing forever that everyone's been playing forever that don't need that anymore because a white card that only hits artifacts and enchantments is just not good enough. A white card like Fateful Absence that only hits creatures and planeswalkers now isn't good enough either. Now I'm taking that card out of my deck because I'm going to put Stroke of Midnight in there over that because it's hitting the enchantments, the artifacts, the planeswalkers, everything except lands. No color is close as far as it comes to removal. I don't even think I need to talk about it anymore. I think we're all very aware of it. Moving on to, again, as I hinted at, the new white board wipe that, it, again, is w which white board wipes are you putting in your mono white deck? Outs like if I'm in Boros, I also have Blasphemous Act. If I'm in Orzov, I also have Toxic Deluge. Even if I'm just in mono white, what board wipes are you putting in? You're putting in the one that fit best, I guess. Expel the interlopers. Three white, white sorcery. Choose a number between zero and 10. Destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. It's the board wipe in that theme. We're so spoiled in white board wipes that now we get to pick the ones that advantage us. And I like ones that advantage us. Again, we just got that one from Lord of the Rings. Even though it's a phenomenal board wipe, it's only going to fit in the in themes where that's a good fit. And same with this one. You could put this in any deck, I guess. Destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. So I could pick zero and destroy all the creatures. But, you know, five mana destroy all creatures is not super great, but you could do that. You're going to put in a deck, I think, like obviously those wall decks, it's super good. If you just have a commander that is a really low power, could be extra good, right? It just goes in those decks where it fits. That's where you're going to play it. All right, we got a cycle of court cards. We have, we've had these before. They are, you know, enchantments, they're courts, they enter the battlefield. You get the monarchy. Again, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about the two that I think are the best. Court of Embereth is the red one, two red, red enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. So again, just pointing out that you are guaranteed to get a card draw after this. That is important. Any of this court series, because of course you can't lose the monarchy unless it's through combat damage, which you're not going to be able to do unless someone else's turn. I guess if you flash this in, that could be the case. The, the, so don't do that. Play it on your turn. You're guaranteed to get the card draw. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a 3-1 red knight creature token. So that already is good. I have a four mana card that enters the battlefield, draws me a card, and then is going to spit out a 3-1 red knight creature token every turn. That's pretty good. Not bad. But then if you're the monarch, Court of Embereth deals X damage to each opponent where X is the number of creatures you control. That's really good. And again, this is just a great win con in pretty much any deck that has creatures. I mean, if you're in that Krenko deck, you know, you're, you're going to look at this card and go, okay, well, it's making knights, so it doesn't really fit what I'm doing. No, you're going to put it in there because I don't even have to attack now. I just tap my Krenko, create 10 goblins, and all my opponents lose 12 life or something, right? Whatever it is on my upkeep. Now I don't even have to attack if I'm in that Krenko deck or any deck like that. Any deck where you plan on having lots of creatures in play. Obviously, it's just a slam dunk and a whole lot of decks. I think it's probably the best one of the cycle and they're all pretty good. This one I think is probably the best. I think it's likely going to see the most play because it fits in the most decks. I also really like Court of Vantress, two blue, blue enchantment. The blue one obviously enters the battlefield. You become the monarch at the beginning of your upkeep. Choose up to one other target enchantment or artifact. If you're the monarch, you may create a token that's a copy of it. 
If you're not the monarch, you may have Court of Vantress become a copy of it, except it has this ability. So there might be themes that this fits in. Again, if you're in an Adrix and Nev deck, seems like a slam dunk. But even outside of that, just any deck, again, I have two mono blue decks. I'm giving this consideration for both of them because it is just super, super good value. If you're the monarch, I just picked the best, which is likely again going to be the enchantment, probably. Could be an artifact, but likely it's going to be someone's Ristic Study Smothering Tithe, something like that, right? And I get a copy of it. If I'm not the monarch, I can just make a copy of it with this, but create a token copy. Oh man, that's good. If I'm the monarch, like, hey, I'll, t I'll have a Ristic study now. Thank you. Next turn, I'll have a smothering tithe. Thank you. Next turn, I'll create a token copy of my own propaganda because I, you know, let's, let's get another one of those going because I don't want to get attacked. In the enchantment tribal deck, it gets extra good because it is an enchantment itself and is creating token copies of enchantments. Maybe artifact enchantment tribal as well. It might fit. Just it's slam I'm dunking a lot of decks, but also even my two mono blue decks where I'm not really doing any of this stuff, I still might try to find room for it. All right, getting to probably maybe the best card from this set. I, I think this might be the card that sees them out of this whole entire set. This might be the one that sees the most play in the commander format. Moonshaker Cavalry, five white, 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 Spirit Knight, six, six with flying. When it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain flying and get plus X, plus X until end of turn where X is the number of creatures you control. So it is the white crater hoof, as I've talked about before, when I talked about it in a spoiler video about a month ago now, I guess. What's to talk about? It's the white crater hoof. Maybe crater hoof is a little bit better than this but it's essentially a white crater hoof. We all know where it's going to get played. There's not much to talk about here. It's likely going to be a pretty expensive card and it's going to be a commander staple forever without question. Spirit tribal, night tribal, for sure it's going to be extra good, but it's going to see a ton of play without question. All right, and I'm going to end off by talking about Throne of Eldraine, which is a really interesting one. And it's called Throne of Eldraine, which is funny. Obviously, that's what the original set was called. And of course, it's a colorless card, which I, I always like to talk about those colorless cards that are going to fit in any deck because they're colorless. But this one, that's not necessarily the case. And, you know, this card was talked about by another, another content creator that I was watching, and he was talking about how busted it was. And I was like, okay, I don't think it's busted. Hold on. Like, I think this is a really good card and I really like it for a very specific reason. It's definitely not busted though. Okay. So five mana legendary artifact. As it enters the battlefield, choose a color. Choose one color. Tap, add four mana of the chosen color. Oh, that's so good, right? But, okay, let's stop there. Five mana artifact that you tap to add four mana of the chosen color. If that's all this card said, that would be pretty good and you definitely could put it like it's better than a Guild of Lotus. Okay. However, spend this mana only to cast mono-colored spells of the chosen color. Now, that is why I really like this card. Again, I love cards. I talked about this with Commander's Plate. I talked about this with War Room. I love cards that are encouraging you to play less colors and are giving an advantage to decks that play less colors. So for that reason alone, this card's not busted, right? I mean, outside of a monocolor deck, would you ever play this even? I don't, like in a three color deck, add four mana of the chosen color, spend it only to cast monocolored spells. So first of all, any card in your deck that is more than one color, you can't cast. Also, I will point out a colorless spell is not monocolored. Monocolored means mono red, mono green, mono white, or mono black. That's it. Spend this mana only to cast monocolored spells means you can't use it for activated abilities. You can't use it for anything else. You can only use it for casting monocolored spells. So if I'm in a three color deck, what color am I choosing? This just becomes a really bad card. If, I, if I'm in a Mardu deck and I choose white, I can only use this to cast my mono white spells. That doesn't seem very good, right? It also has another ability though. Pay three, tap, draw two cards, spend only mana of the chosen color to activate this ability. So again, that's a decent draw option, but outside of a monocolor deck, again, I'm in a Mardu deck. Now I've chosen white. I can only tap white mana to use that ability. So that, right, I don't like that restriction either. I like this card because it is a really nice fit and in monocolor decks, but outside of a monocolor deck, I don't know. Would you risk playing this even in two color deck? I wouldn't. We are in the situation where we have so much stuff that we can be cramming into our decks are we going to find room for this in a two color deck? No chance. I'm the guy who has lots of monocolor decks. I have seven monocolor decks. Which ones am I putting this in? When this first got spoiled, my patrons were talking about my discord and I was like, it's good. I like it. 
But I don't know, like, where am I going to... Again, maybe my Brallin deck, because red has trouble drawing cards. Not for the Mana Rock part, for the card draw part. I would put this in my Brallin deck, my my one mono red deck, because in my opinion, mono red is the only color that really has trouble drawing cards. I can put it in there. It's a good Mana Rock, really good Mana Rock, I would say. I can't use this to cycle or anything, and I do a lot of cycling in the deck, right? I'm coming up with reasons why it's not super great. I can only use it to cast spells but it's also a pretty good draw option. So maybe I'll put it in again. I can only spend man of the chosen color. I can't, my colorless lands, I can't tap to do use that ability to draw cards. So it's very restricting. Just keep that in mind for all the people getting super excited. I think it's good. And I definitely think you could put it in any mono color deck and it would be good, but people might be getting a little overboard with this card where it's it's maybe not as good as you think it is. I certainly wouldn't play it out of sight of a monocolor deck. No chance. All right, that is it. That is all a long video. I talked about 30 cards. So of course it's going to be, that is it. You guys let me know in the comments below what you think of these cards or maybe some favorite 99 cards only from this set that I didn't talk about. Certainly there are a bunch of really good archetype specific ones that I didn't talk about because I don't usually like talk about the really archetype specific ones. And again, the commanders I will be talking about in another video. So stay tuned for that. That is it for today though. And thanks for tuning in.